Hey everyone, uh, sorry for, for running a little late. I forgot to click the go live button on, um, on YouTube. Uh, still getting used to just the, you know, exclusively uh, streaming to YouTube. So um, I appreciate, you know, everyone joining tonight. Um, this is my first time, you know, first week back. It's been what, about with the holidays and then I was out last week, it's been about two weeks. Um, so it's uh but but i got a lot done i got a lot done last week i did i did take some time um and kind of chill out but uh we'll go over kind of what what i've been up to and um kind of take a quick break from kind of the devnet expert um things so um yeah we won't be diving into anything related to the exam today um anything specifically now we will be looking at the um, at uh, as you can tell on the screen Cisco modeling labs. So we are still looking at you know doing uh, network labs and uh, probably a little bit of coding and, and maybe diving in some APIs today. So uh, definitely not complete you know disconnect from from you know the expert lab. So um, so yeah, I guess let's just go ahead and get started with kind of where we're at. Um, take it out of that all right so if you guys have kind of been tuning into my um, Twitter you've probably seen me kind of go on about installing uh, VMware's ESXi which is which is essentially a uh, type 1 hypervisor and um, part of that is <laughs> the reason I'm bringing that up is because I've been fighting with getting um, Cisco CML stood up, which, you know, Cisco Modeling Lab. I, I purchased it on a Black Friday sale. Uh, Cisco actually had a really nice sale on it. I think it was just like 40% off. I think it was only like four hours long too. So if you didn't get, um, you know, if you didn't get in that four hours, then you kind of lost out. You didn't lose out completely because they, they, it still was on sale, but it wasn't on that deep of a discount. So uh, I figured what the heck, might as well try it out. Um, and so I, I was pretty confident I could get it stood up on a, an open source hypervisor I was using, which, you know, if you're, if you've been part of the stream, you kind of know, uh, called Proxmox. Um, I failed <laughs> to put it, to put it bluntly. I, I tried and, I, and it's funny cause you know, it explicitly says, you know, in the CML documentation that it only, it, you know, VMware, ESXi, Workstation, are the only really supported um, kind of hypervisors. But I was like, hey, this might be a good chance that I could take, you know, take what I know and try to get it to work, right? I, I wasn't gonna open a support ticket or, you know, try to uh, nag on Cisco about it because I was like, I'm gonna try something that's not quote unquote officially supported and then potentially have a pretty cool blog post about it, right? So that way, you know, it's not just about okay i got it up and running but hey i got it up and running and learned the this this and this along the way um i, I noted the struggles that i went through with proxmox but ultimately i ran it after about um 10 to 12 hours of troubleshooting i could not get this one issue figured out so i just called it quits um because ultimately you know i'm not trying to like there's only there's only so much troubleshooting I want to go to. It's the juice isn't worth the squeeze when it comes to that because I'm just trying to get CML up and running, right? Um, I'm not trying to learn about a anything specific or or try to fit uh, CML into Proxmox. So I was like, hey, you know, I think it's about time I start looking at ESXi, and uh, sure enough, two hours. I mean, if you've been you know tuned into my Twitter, two hours I got ESXi. Um, which obviously completely wiped Proxmox, all the VMs on that, um, installed ESXi, which that surprisingly took like maybe 20 minutes, um, which, which is mind blowing to me. Cause I was like, holy crap, it wiped Proxmox. Didn't have any sort of, you know, partitioning issues or anything like that. Um, and then within, yeah, within two hours, I backed up my old even G environment uh, the labs, the images, all that good stuff, and stood up CML all within two hours. So 
pretty it was pretty awesome I, I felt after trouble like like I said with the week off I took a little bit of time to get Proxmo um CML stood up in Proxmox and you know through trouble troubleshooting efforts I couldn't get it up so um yeah it was really nice basically um kind of part of Sunday mostly last night I kind of just went through it and it worked you know without a hitch so pretty fun stuff um but I'm, I'm not going to go through everything um I will most likely write a blog post about my struggles with Proxmox and specifically what I had issues with with CML. Um, I will say Proxmox is a really, really good open source alternative to ESXi. Um, I had no issues with setting up my um, Ubuntu VM, the 20.04, and even G um, because they were ISOs and I could just spin it up, configure them. Uh, the issue with CML really even wasn't the ISO. It was actually the kind of the quote unquote the setup script that you have to go through. So that's kind of that GUI interface. Um, I say GUI, but it's really like a CLI slash GUI interface where you set up like the root user, kind of like you would with Eve and G. Um, but the problem was it does uh, what's called what it said in the loading screen as a network check. And um, that network check kept failing. It kept saying, "Hey, you don't have um, access to Cisco.com, or you know, we, you're basically something's wrong with your network." So I, I went over and over, and I was like, "Okay, what's going on? Like DNS? Is this not getting an IP address? Like what? What's going on?" I ended up finding out that basically I had an issue where the um, the virtual bridge that was created or that was being used by Proxmox that was mapped to the physical um, NIC on the server, uh, CML was creating a separate virtual bridge and trying to use that. Um, and I don't want to say it created, because that may be the wrong word, but basically it was trying to use a separate bridge, virtual bridge, um, and it caused a bunch of issues. So I went through and like manually mapped the physical NIC to the bridge, the virtual bridge that Proxmox, or I'm sorry, that the CML script created, um, or that the CML script was using uh, in its testing. And I tried, you know, basically went through manually, mapped everything out in the, um, cause it's just, sent, it's sent OS 8 under the hood. I know you see sent OS 7 here. I'm just running an old version of VM, ESXi. Um, so it doesn't recognize it, but I went through and did that and try, clicked retry on the script and it kept failing. So I was thinking all these different things like, okay, do I do a startup? Can I create some sort of startup script that will like do the mapping for me? Cause I knew like the names of the virtual bridge and the physical Nick stayed the same, right? There was a lot of uh, static values that I could use. Um, but then at that point I was like, okay, why am I doing this, right? <laughs> like, why why are we going through this? Um, so that's when I was like, all right, let's just go through. I don't have too much set up in Proxmox. Like I had, besides these two VMs, even G and CML, I had a, um, a Ubuntu 20.04 VM um, that was set up just like the DevNet Expert uh, workstation is gonna be set up. I still gotta get that set back up, but not a huge issue, so. So anyways, that's kind of what I've been battling. Um, and so tonight we're gonna take a look at CML. We're gonna take a look at uh, just standing up a lab, uh, powering on a couple of devices. And then I'm gonna actually take a look at the API. I'm actually, I, I wanna start diving into that a bit because um, one of the first things I thought about was, okay, I, I've seen some of the documentation for, the C, for CML, the API. Um, and you could do things, if I remember correctly, like uh, get the list of labs, stand up a lab, assign devices to labs, um, which obviously I'm going to clarify tonight. But if that's the case, uh, man, I, I thought of all these ideas. I was like, okay, what if, what if we declared, you know, this is more big picture, but let's say, you know, going back to infrastructure as code, what if we declare a device or configuration, you know, we want to apply this configuration to a device, right? And um, 
Julio, who's actually normally in um, these live streams, had a really good blog series about creating a CI/CD pipeline. And he used, um, uh, let me think, Nornir, uh, Suzy Q, and Batfish, I believe, were the three tools he used for his validation and pushing out configuration. But I was like, man, what if we added onto that something like that? And you can use API calls to your CML server that's powered on and spin up a virtual lab, right? And you could assign it all, you know, use an inventory file, create that dynamically, and then assign that a um, that stage configuration to your lab environment, make sure it all works and actually run it against the lab environment and then sp basically spin up that lab environment and then um, destroy it. And then you can, and then that code that will be saved and potentially you could save the lab environment, um, like the actual lab so that way you could revisit it. But then you would push out those changes to production afterwards. So it kind of adds that extra step. And you know, I, I saw this at a um, kind of this same philosophy at Cisco Live in 2019 in San Diego. Um, Hank Preston did a really good presentation on all of this and, and how you could use something like CML. Um, you could do it with EVNG as well, as long as you have the available um, API calls or, or ways to interact with it, right? Maybe an SDK. And you could spin up a test lab as part of that CICD pipeline. So, um, so I've been, th I've been thinking about that too. And definitely, um, I definitely think that would be pretty cool to do, but before I get ahead of myself, you know, we'll take a look at CML and, uh, kind of just start with the basics and then on build on that. So, and if you're in the, if you're on the live stream, uh, please feel free to say hello in the chat or, you know, if you have any questions as, as we're going along, uh, this is a hundred percent collaborative. I, I definitely don't want to feel like, um, you know, I'm just kind of telling you what I think and I don't want to hear what you have to say. So please let me know if you have questions. Um, there are no dumb questions with CML. Um, I have some experience with it, but everything that we're going through tonight is going to be kind of a raw reaction and, uh, just kind of figuring things out as we go. So um, I have it up here. Um, I think I just have it. I don't. I th think I just have the admin account still. So we'll just get logged in. Um, oh, and by the way, I I followed to get this set up. Um, this documentation on DevNet actually is a really good starting point. Um, I followed the installation guide for um, the right here, deploying the OVA on ESXi. I followed this to a T, including these additional steps. Like there were some other things like uh, that I wasn't even aware of, like ch um, changing the shares of the CPU of the VM to high, um, check enabling uh, performance counters. I did this to a T, and it worked. Right. So I, I don't, I don't, there's no, I, I would say if you're, if you have questions like, Hey, how'd you get it set up? You have any hiccups? Um, I use the ESXi obviously the instructions, but I'm sure workstation fusion is just the same. Um, make sure to read everything. That's all I got to say, because for example, like memory reservation, um, they suggest reserving and locking the entire memory allocation. So this box, um, required, I gave it 64 gigs of RAM, um, just because this, my home server has 128 gigs of RAM. So I had plenty to spare. So I just gave it 64 and it, it locked it up. Um, but just know that you have to lock it up if it's not a dedicated host, um, as suggested by the instructions. Hey James, uh, James says, Hey, what's up? Good stuff. I also picked up CML and need to get it going need to get a VMware environment up and running. Yeah. Um, I think I saw you say something on Twitter about that. Uh, yeah, man, I, I'm just getting started. So, um, I'm just a little ahead of you, but yeah, I, I would say if you don't have like a, any sort of home server, um, I put it out on Twitter about like the specs of my home server. I bought it on was it eBay. I bought a used, uh, Dell R620. It has, um, two 
eight core processors um, and 128 gigs of RAM. I don't know the other specs, <laughs> but I got one that had a lot of RAM purposely for like, because I know I'm, I'm gonna be using, um, doing it network virtualization, which requires a lot of memory, um, especially when you have everything stood up. So yeah, it, it, it wasn't too bad if you wanna go the home server route. Um, obviously you could get VMware workstation, like if you have a real beefy desktop or a computer, uh, you could do a workstation or, or fusion if you're on a Mac, so. Because I don't think, I, I mean, you could try it, but I don't think the free version of VMware, um, the VMware, what's it called, player, workstation player, I think, uh, they, I don't think that's officially supported. Uh, it's just workstation or fusion, which I know are, are, are the kind of the paid versions. Hey, Ganesh, how, how are you doing? I, I'm glad you're here, glad you're here. Um, I don't know if the other Ganesh is here as well, but <laughs> like we had last time, but uh, I'm glad you're here. All right, so yeah, I just wanted to comment on this because follow these instructions to a T and it will get you where you need to be. So one of the first things I had to do I know I said I wasn't gonna go through like installing it, um, but I, I just wanted to mention, um, one of the first things I had to do as soon as I logged in with before creating a lab or anything is you'll see in the d down the bottom right here, and I'm sorry if my head's in the way, I see on stream my head's kind of in the way, but let's see, there we go. Um, it says status okay. Uh, when you first log in, it will say like unregistered or not registered. So if we go to tools and licensing, so if you're unfamiliar, Cisco has a, um, what they call a smart licensing model with their network devices, but also with a lot of their products, including like Cisco ICE, uh, CML, and plenty others. And all that all this means is um, you have a virtual account um, you know, with Cisco and it basically keeps a thing as like a, a virtual bank with tokens, right? And it will, your products will check in, um, you know, over the web to Cisco's site and say, okay, does this user have authorization um, to use this product? And luckily, you know, with with the learning network, um, it's not as it's not as um, heavy. I'll call it as like an enterprise environment where you would actually go to the Cisco smart licensing, like through the support page. Um, this, you literally just plug in um, a token that you get as soon as you download or as soon as you purchase CML, it'll come with a, um, it'll tell you like a download link and it'll redirect you to the software download page. And then it will also have a license, um, a license token, which is basically just a bunch of characters. And you can use that um, if you choose, like, I don't, I don't know what's going to be shown, so I'm not going to click on it. Um, but if you click on choose licenses, uh, you can actually click register and just copy paste that token and it will phone home to your smart license account. And in this case, just kind of back to your Cisco learning network account and ensure that you're authorized. Um, I will say with this, I had a quick hiccup with it. Um, it immediately went to registered, immediately, um, but it didn't say authorized. And I was using the key that was there, um, but I generated the key like a few days before I um, actually installed this. Uh, so actually it was like a week. So I was like worried, I was like, uh-oh, does someone have my token? Like what's going on? Why is this not authorized? And the issue, like I wouldn't normally be like, that worried about it because I had a 90 day evaluation. But the problem was when you're not authorized, if you're registered, but not authorized, you can't really do too much. Like you can't create labs or I'm sorry, power on labs or anything like that. So I was like, man, this could be, <laughs> this could be rough. Um, but I went through, I refreshed it. I did like, I tried going through deregistering the token and all this. Um, but what ended up happening was it was a UI bug. <laughs> um, all I did was log out of CML um, and then log back in and then it showed as authorized. Uh, so yeah, 
it was just in case you run into that just in case you like you get it all stood up and you choose your license and you copy and paste your token and, and it still says not authorized after you choose your license um don't worry just give it give it some time first off second log out and log back in to see if that helps but just be patient with it um i definitely wasn't patient and that's you know kind of what i ran into but anyways uh that's it i mean after i got that's obviously assuming you got the vm set up but after the vm got uh, set up i copy and pasted my token registered authorized and then that was it then i created a quick lab so um I will say that all of, so the only comparison I have, I have experience with GNS3 and even G. Um, obviously they're a little more robust with the images that you can use, whereas Cisco, it's gonna be mostly Cisco. Um, even G, you know, GNS3, you can upload different images, different devices and whatnot. So um, yeah, I, I, I like that when you click on add notes out of the box, all of these devices, um, you can use all of them. They, because what CML does is it has like a core image for the VM. And then if you notice, let me see if I could view it here. Um, right here. So if you notice there's, cause, because there will be two different images, one's an OVA or an ISO for the actual, like I call the core VM that you actually use to install the image on, you know, install the VM. And then the other um, is this ISO file here. And this is actually the ISO file that contains all the images. And you basically just use it and attach it as a CD drive. Um, obviously I don't have a physical CD, like it's just the ISO virtual image. Um, and it just connects whenever we power on the VM. So that actually holds all the images for um, CML. So it's kind of neat because that way you don't have to worry about like FTP and images and um, like with even G, you have to do some things to create like, you know, the QCOW image and, and whatnot. All of that's kind of here. So um, you see like CSR, ASA, the iOS V images that we were using, you know, in the even G, NXOS, XRV. I don't really have too many, too much familiarity with XRV. Um, and then even things like Ubuntu, T-Rex, WAN emulator and whatnot. So um, all this is kind of out of the box, which is great. Um, that's what I wanted to touch on. Yeah, so I, drug, I basically just drug those over. I connected them all. Um, this is where it kind of gets a little different from any of the other simulation tools I've used um, is kind of the the layout. So everything's kind of at the bottom here. You'll notice that there are the nodes, the links, the interfaces. And, you know, everything's kind of in this like, I, like a horizontal fashion, I guess, like different, like a dash lid at the bottom. Um, and you know, you can do like, it, it allows you to build some bootstrap configs and, and has logging and everything. Um, but like, for example, even G everything's along the right side and it's kind of like a pop out menu. Right. So it, I, it took me a second to get used to this and I'm still kind of getting used to it, but, um, you'll notice, you know, it tells you all your nodes, whether they're off or on. Um, but I'm actually going to start up this lab. The nice thing I, I will say is you can, at the bottom here, you can actually monitor your VM. Um, so with this VM, um, it's using both CPUs, both sockets. It's using up to eight, eight CPUs, I think. I think I have it set for eight CPUs, uh, 64 gigs of memory, um, and then disk space is not an issue. It's about 120 gigs and they recommend, or I think I have it at 100 gigs and they recommend at least 100, so. Uh, you'll see the CPU ramps up a ton here. Um, mostly with that's with the CSR image. Uh, and that takes the longest to boot up. You'll notice, I don't know if it's gonna be hard to see on, on stream, but you'll notice these little like, they look kind of gr yellow, green, yellow. Um, the little arrows that kind of go in a circle, that just shows that the image, that the devices are booting up. So um, as with the other simulation tools, uh, minus even G, you do have to 
well, I think with even G as well, you have to have these uh, devices have to be powered off or in a, like a stop state before um, you can connect them. So like they can't be powered on whenever you want to connect them together. Like I like I already have. So we'll uh, wait for these to boot up here. And you'll see what's taken the longest. Oh, I forgot the NXOS as well. So NXOS and the CSR are obviously just pegging the CPU. Um, iOS V, I think, is probably already started. Like, let's just take a look. Well, it says it's still booting up, but let's just take a look. Um, let's see. Uh, open console. Oh no, it's still booting up. Oh no. Let's see. I didn't do anything with these, by the way, either. Um, I know I put a screenshot on, on Twitter last night, but I really, I just wanted to see how quickly, like, if these things can boot up and how quickly they can. Um, and then that way I don't have too many issues with like actually getting to work on the network simulation part. So it's kind of still booting up. Actually, this might be the CSR. No, never mind. Because the CSR, the way the interfaces are named, this isn't the iOS V image. So I don't. Yeah, it's just it's just different because it's trying to do the PMP, the plug and play service. Um. Yeah. So we'll let that boot up, but. It's kind of neat. I mean, like I said, it, it has, it tells you how everything's connected. Um, the image definition. So pretty neat. Oh, and by the way, I totally disregarded this very neat feature. Um, and as you can see, I'm in dark mode. And I thought that was very neat. But the way to switch that on and off, by default, whenever you first power this up, it'll, it'll be in light mode. See what I mean? Like, it's a little too much. Cisco kind of went with this whole, like, um, white, light gray, and then this, like, really Cisco. I call it Cisco blue because <laughs> it's, like, this really light blue. Like, you can see it with the Cisco name up here. Um, and it just doesn't work with, with just, like, a bright white background. So um, switch it over to dark. But... That's how you do it. You click on your username and there's a little like slider. Um, so anyway, anyways, we'll let this boot up. You, yeah, the CSR is kind of still booting up. Um, the NX OS here, looks like it's just about ready. I think it's just Cisco. So some of these images out of the box have um, user accounts already on them and so I just it's just username Cisco password Cisco and that's actually outlined I believe here overview maybe I it's definitely in these documents um, Um, it's in these documents. It outlines, but most of the time, if you try your standard, you know, Cisco, Cisco, admin, admin, um, it'll work. So, but yeah, now all of our devices are connected. So, the one issue, and I've been looking at this recently, is um, you know, with with others, with other simulation tools, you can actually open up multiple console connections, you know, using kind of Telnet. Um, whereas CML, everything's in the browser. So like if I wanted to go, like I'm in the Nexus um, console now, right? Actually, this is, wow, that's insane. I didn't realize it had like this many <laughs> interfaces. Um, anyways. That's pretty cool.
But if I wanted to go go from the Nexus console to the CSR console, I have to click on this little kind of console button, and you see how it got rid of the Nexus console down there. Um, see, Cisco kind of they went, they changed they the way they accomplished like you being able to quickly go through uh, different consoles. Um, without having to like do this, like clicking on each device, is they created this uh, tool called the breakout tool. And I've still like, I've read through some of the documentation um, and I've tried like, you basically download this piece of software that runs locally on your machine that you access, like it says here, um, you can configure it using web interface, accessible, local host, port 8080. Um, but it's a piece of software, right? It's like it's like an additional tool. Um, and realistically, because I'm on the personal um, license with up to only up to 20 nodes possible in a lab, I most likely will just create a management network and connect it using an external node. Um, and was it Paul? forget on Twitter last night I I've been think I was thinking about doing it anyways but Paul mentioned about using an, what's called an external node which essentially uh, connects your CML lab to your um, actual network right so that way I can SSH to it as you know from my from my PC so that's probably the way I'll do it I'm not gonna like go through the breakout tool most likely um, I might just to like see how comparable it is and whether it's you know something I, I should be using but most likely I'll, I'll just add a external node connect the management interfaces of all these devices and just use like a ma create like a management network just like I did in um, even G so that's kind of what the breakout tool is and uh, the one cool thing I, I definitely want to like take a look at and we'll probably do on another stream um, or I might do offline and, and put something on Twitter about is uh, custom VM images. So I think this is going to be pretty neat is um, the way you can customize uh, image definitions. And you can actually do it. So you can do it through the, um, the dashboard, like the web GUI. But they actually have, and let me see if I can find the GitHub for creating a new one. You actually use like YAML to define a new device, which I thought was awesome. Now that's uh, Pi. Oh, it has a Pi TS integration. Uh, using Pi TS, you can write tests that execute and parse. Okay. Pi TS must be enabled if you want to use configuration extraction on nodes associated with. You can enable PyTS support by leave the use and test bed disabled if you're not planning to use PyTS. Ooh. Oh, that, that could be something. That, that, I did not know that existed. Um, I'd be interested on how that works though. Like what that, what does that property do? Like if I said enable PyTS, what, ITS settings. Let me scroll up a little bit. Man, now I'm like really interested in that. This is Linux. Okay. No definition. And I guess I should probably start with what is a no definition because I just kind of jumped to like, <laughs> I, I'm really bad with, with that. I just jumped to like, okay, show me the nerd knobs and some of the cool shiny features. Um, so all of these nodes here are, they have a definition. Um, and let me pull that up real quick. So you'll see like we have different definitions for iOS V, iOS V layer two. Let's just go to the CSR. Cannot modify, yeah, that's fine. So this is just like an example. Um, so the CSR 1000 V is um, a node which has an associated definition, right? Um, you'll see it, it's kind of like defining um, 
like if you're familiar with GNS3, defining a template, um, a device template where you know you put a prefix and and even G is the same way where you where you add a node you can put prefixes if you're adding multiple nodes, um, the number uh, the number of CPUs the memory all of that good stuff, the interfaces. So, but this is kind of interesting. <laughs> I'm going to be, I, I will just tell you this now. I'm going to definitely be looking at this offline. Uh, what this means. Enable in PyTS using testbed. Because config extract command. Like, does it use... Does it generate a testbed file for you? And then how would I use that? How would I extract that testbed? And then how would I extract, like, here it says config extract command show run. So, like, does it, because there's, like, a config object, or I'm sorry, a config module that you can pull the show run out of the genie library, or does it actually run, sh like, um, execute show run or parse show run? Dude, that is... I'm going to definitely look into that because that is pretty, has me excited. Um, anyways, but like it adds some additional features, right? Like um, I know even G has like a startup script um, that you can create or startup bootstrap com, um, script where you can like establish a few uh, config, right? Like a bootstrap config. Well, here it's, it's a little simpler, right? You just put in what you want, the content, um, and then what to write it to. Man, that PyTS thing has me thinking. But this is like a good definition, right? Or I guess I shouldn't get it confused with, because this is actually a node definition. Like this is the actual, this is the image definition, I should say. There's a node definition that describes like a container. Think of it as like the node definition is the container. It's a CSR 1000V. There's no software version associated with it. There's not um, anything specific. The only thing that's specific is how much memory and how much CPU to provide it. And I think it also assigns the interfaces as we saw. But the image definition is the actual like, okay, we're running a CSR with iOS XE 17.3.2. And we're using this disk image here. And this disk image is what you would download um, from like cisco.com, right? So you would download the image. Uh, the Linux native simulation, you don't really need to use, but the image definition just tells you, um, you know, use 17.3.2. I imagine, and I haven't tested it yet, but I definitely will be is like, okay, for example, um, I know that the newest iOS XE, um, or one of the newest recommendations was 17.3.3. So like, and I know like 17, what is it in the DevNet Expert? Um, sir, DevNet Expert equipment software list. Let's pull it up. So like, for example, if I need to run a CSR or I need to run a, um, I think they're using a Catalyst 8000V but I think it's running like 17.3.5. Oh, it's just, it just says 17.5. So like, let's say I need to run a CSR 1000V or an 8000V, a Catalyst 8000V running 17.5, right? 17.5.1, let's say. Like, how easy is that to do? So maybe I'll, um, maybe I'll, re I'll put a, I'll record a video. Because I've been wanting to start actually recording some smaller YouTube videos because I know it's not exactly the most fun to sift through a one and a half to two hour long stream uh, on playback. So maybe once I figure out the Pi TS and um, I'm actually going to write, write it down. Let me grab a pen. Maybe. All right. Let me see. So the PyTS, PyTS, and um, defining a new image, new image. Okay. Yeah. So I think those that would be pretty neat if 
I could figure out those two things. So, awesome. That's cool stuff. But, um, but like to actually define a new node definition, like I think creating a Catalyst 8000 V would be a great example of creating a new node definition. Um, it would probably be very relative to the CSR 1000 V um, because it probably has, you know, three to four gigs of DRAM and then probably one to t one or two um, virtual CPUs. And then the interfaces are probably about the same. So um, that will actually be kind of a good thing too is creating an, a Catalyst 8000 V. So let's see. Oh, and I know I just went into the CSR. But here are the different image definitions that come out of the box for CML 2.2.3. Um, so you'll see 15.9, which actually is great because that's what version I need for the DevNet Expert. Um, and then iOS VL2 is 15.2. Where's that at? It just says 2020. Okay. Let's just see. Uh, Hard to tell whether that says if that's 15.2. <laughs> it just says 2020. Um, either way, I, it's not a problem. I have it on um, my even G environment, the 15.2 image. So the 17.32, the like I said, the iOS XRV. I don't have too much um, experience with. Uh, I've never really messed with iOS XR. I know it's highly programmatical programmatical that's probably not even a word <laughs> um but i know you can do a, there's a lot of um ways to programmatically interface with it maybe that's a better way of describing it <laughs> um and then the different nexus virtual nexus platforms which let me see we only need a 9300v so this will do but it's but i need nine three eight this is nine three six okay so i mean there's another perfect example of like a new node definition well see that's the thing i wouldn't need to create a new node definition because nxos 9300v is already created i would need a new image definition so i do nine three dot eight so cool man that is cool and then that's actually nice ubuntu 2004 because that's what is also used for um, the workstation, but because like it's a workstation, I'm going to create just a, within VM. Well, I'm logged out now, but in ESXi, I'm just going to create a new VM with 20.04. So, okay. So we kind of have a, a little understanding. We, you know, how setting it up, getting the licensing straight now, creating a lab, booting up the devices in the lab. Um, and then kind of how the node definitions, image definitions work. Let's, um, let's just jump right to the API. Because why not, right? So I will just kind of a forewarning. I have not used this API before. So I don't know the uh, any sort of authorization required. I don't know any of the kind of the endpoints that are um, available. So we'll, it'll be news to me as well. <laughs> All right. So requires an authentication token. It must be conveyed in the, okay, easy enough. It's a bearer token. So how do we get my bearer token? I could download the entire API if I want, but what's the fun in that? Let's just create our own calls. So I'm gonna open up Postman. I'm gonna use Postman to uh, test out this API. It hasn't been too long since I opened Postman. I'm sure there's an update, but didn't have post. I just had Postman open probably like within the past month or so. 
Okay, let's see. Oh, there you go. It did update. Just delete all these. This, uh, this was with um, that was some Merlin stuff. Okay, let's figure it out. Let's first create a new um, environment, and let me just make sure I don't have anything. Uh, How do I create a new environment? Now you know what, we don't really have too many calls. I'm just gonna, I just put no environment out of my list, by the way. Um, okay. So let's do this first. Let's authenticate to the system. And so that way we can get a token, right? So um, obviously there's different ways to authenticate uh, you know, you can have basic auth, you can use a, to a bearer token, um, sometimes there's an API key. So uh, in this case, we're going to need a token to authenticate. And what I'm going to do is, let's see, sorry, just figuring out where I can add a new... Um, folder collection. We'll call this one CML home lab. Okay. I don't need the documentation. Okay. All right. So what we're going to need to do is first create a request to authenticate. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna copy the URL. And we're basically gonna copy exactly what's here. So it's just the URL um, slash API slash V0 slash authenticate. Um, and it says down here that the request body is a JSON object that holds your authentication data. So basically what we need to do is um, do a post request to the authenticate endpoint and um, let me see if I can actually create an environment real quick. Because what I want to do is actually use um, uh, let's see file because I want to add some variables and I don't want to I don't want to put my basically I don't want to put my username in plain text and we're just gonna say. And I'll kind of go over this as, as we move along a little bit. Save. How do I create a uh, new, oh, duh. All right, so just so everyone kind of see, I'm sorry, I got the screen split, so that's why you see probably part of Postman. Um, so, in a recent, I say recent, probably a few months ago, they changed around the user interface and I have this zoomed in. So it's like super hard to find things. Um, so I'm in my workspace here and I have all these different collections for different topics that I've studied and just some home lab things. Um, so we'll do, we'll create a new environment and we'll call this environment uh, CML personal and we're going to call this one username and this one password and I'm actually going to go hide this real quick so that way I can fill it in and I th think that should work All right, 
And if for whatever reason it somehow does get leaked on the screen, it's not that big of an issue because it's all offline anyways and it's just a lab environment. So uh, let's see, what, what are we looking at here? Form data, JSON. Um, okay, so I created a request. I, I saved the requests to the CML home lab folder and it's just the uh, basic authentication request. Um, and so it says here, request body is a JSON object. So we're just gonna basically copy in the JSON, the required JSON. Um, I created a username. I don't know if it's actually gonna work and uh, maybe it will. I don't know if the variable will work or not in um, here. I think I might have to do something else. Password. Okay. All right, so basically you just have to put in your username and password. These double uh, braces are variables. Normally it would stand for a variable and I've only used variables like in the uh, the headers or the actual URI, but I think I got to do something else here, but we'll see. All right, so I'm gonna do a post request. Let's see what happens. Uh, decoding, expecting property naming enclosed in double quotes. All right, so maybe what we need to do is this. Boom. I don't think this is it. I think the problem is I gotta figure that out. Authentication failed. Interesting. Um, let me just make sure that four or three forbidden. All right. Let me make sure I can include environmental variables in include environmental variable in JSON body postman. There we go. How to use in a JSON body. Trying to replace the value. Okay, so this is literally exactly what I'm trying to do. Uh, he has variables that he wants to include in his postman body. Um, let's see. Well, it doesn't look like that was actually the answer. Variable name, initial value, 4242, current value. To use environment as a request, use this in request body. That doesn't make any sense. Because that's what I'm doing. All right, how about this? Postman answers. This is literally from Postman's website. Do they give an example? Oh, that's cool. Okay, so wait. Variable signature. So I have to add it under the folder. Um, open. Oh, notice we're using a pre request script to change the value of the variable present in the body right before. The, uh, I thought that's what you had to do. So. set encryption so we need to get an environmental variable uh, dude is it can I do this in my post man oh mine's all like mine's all like wacky and big so um,
Okay, so let's see. Setting the signature collection variable to um, set an environmental variable. Ew. Perfect. Okay, so all I need to do is use this pre request script. Pre request script. So all this does is. And then password. And I don't think I need the spaces. I'm not like, I don't think that should cause an issue, but I'm just gonna follow. So basically what I have, what I'm doing is um, I'm using their kind of built-in library to get the environmental variable called username and the environmental variable called password. Uh, in Postman, you can do, there's different levels. Um, and you can see here, there's a collection variable, which is set at the collection level, which basically is your folder. So we created a collection called CML Home Lab. So that's the collection level. Then there's the environmental variable, um, which I don't, <laughs> I don't have set, um, which could also be the problem. So now I have the environmental <laughs> environmental variable set, um, or the envir the environment selected the right one that have that has the variables in it. Um, so what it will do is it will get the key username and the key password from the list of environmental variables, and then use it in the body within these double uh, curly braces. Okay. So I think this should work. There we go. Hey, hey, check it out. Um, so 200 okay, perfect. So this is the bearer token. Like I said before, it doesn't bother me that it's, you know, I'm kind of showing it on stream because ultimately, um, It's not that, you know, I'm not too worried about it because this is going to change anyways. And this is all like an offline lab any. So, uh, but you would obviously want to keep this pretty secretive otherwise. Um, so I'm actually going to create another environment variable. Let me see if I can edit this somehow. Uh, we'll just say, we'll call it token. And then do that. Nope. Oh, all right. Oops. <laughs> like I said, if you catch, if you freeze it and you see it, not a huge deal. Um,. Okay, so now we're authenticated. And what do we gotta do next? All right, so we have the token. All right, so we got the token and then we have to the name of the header is authorization, the content is bearer, and then the actual token name. And Postman makes it pretty easy for us because um, we'll just add a request and we'll just say like git labs. Git, uh, git labs. Um, because we can just do bear token and we literally just plug in the environmental variable and like I said before it don't really care if you see it but um, you'll see I, within the double curly braces because it's you know a variable you can see the scope so uh, you know I talked about the collection level and then the environment variable or I'm sorry the environment level um, or the global level this is obviously the environment level and then what the current value is so 
that's set in stone for this particular request. We could set it at the collection level. We could set the authentication to be bare, um, but I kind of just want to go one step at a time. So that's set. And you'll notice um, under headers, we see authorization, bearer, space, and then the token name, just like you see in the documentation here. The name of the header is authorization. All that was set for us by default with Postman, right? It says um, auto, auto generate headers, and that's because we set the auth here. So now we can just focus on the actual request. So we want to get the list of labs. Um, so you can see it says, you know, there's creating a lab, start the specified lab. So like this is the cool stuff I'm talking about here. Oh, there we go. Check this out. Returns YAML with PyTS test lab for specified lab. Ooh, and all you need is the, the lab ID. Oh, oh man. Yikes. So you're telling me that we can get a test lab stood up with all the devices we need, CSRs, whatever, Nexus. It generates a PyTS testbed for us, which then we can, then can take and run against, I mean, you can do whatever, like parse output, run um, a kind of a blitz playbook or create a test script and run it against the environment. Oh man, this is gonna be... And you could start and stop labs with via the API, wipe labs, create notes, download the lab. So like, think about it. You st start the lab, um, or you you know create the start the lab, do your testing, stop the lab, and then download the lab. Um, I don't know what format that's going to be in though. Okay, format's going to be in a YAML, right? So you're basically gonna have a small YAML file that then kind of is the uh, scaffolding that you then can send off to another user or you know another engineer on your team that you can say, okay, I tested my changes in this lab, um, all automated. And then by the way, if you wanna test in them yourselves or just check out the lab environment, here's the small less than a megabyte lab file or YAML file that you then can like import into CML yourself. Oh, this is kind of getting, this is going to be, this is going to get crazy. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, okay. Let's just start by getting the labs. So list of labs visible to user. Uh, whether to show only labs owned by admin or all user labs reasonable only for admin users uh, returns only their labs. Okay don't care about the parameters. So literally it's just slash labs. So it is, um, what was the, here we go. So I'm just going to copy this and, um, just a heads up. I plan on putting this into a variable as well. It's like they read my mind. Are you kidding me? Okay. So we're going to set it as a new variable. <laughs> uh, we'll call it API root. Um, and we'll say it's at the environment variable. Dude, I don't even, what? What? <laughs> you know, like, what are we doing? Um, actually, I am going to change this, though, a little bit. All right, hold on. I actually wanted to change this just a minute. I want to take out the last, I'm taking out the last backslash. So that way here, just to show you what it looks like now. Um, just just if for readability purposes. So now you can see it's the API V0 and then you, then you could put slash and then the endpoint. Um, I just think that's easier. So API root slash, is it just lab? Oops, labs, right? Yeah, just labs, okay, let's see. And we already have the author, 
the token. That's it. That's the only lab. But I only have one lab anyways, so. Oh, I wonder why. Okay, let's see if I, okay. So let's see if I change the name. Let's see if it also changes that or if that's like some randomly generated. Let's see. Man, you can see the CSR runs hot. Look at that, 70%. Up to 95, crazy. Um, let me see, lab notes, lab info. Uh, first lab on stream. Maybe we'll save that. I just don't know if, I, I'm have, I have a feeling though that, that these labs are, did not mean to do that. They're more or less like, yeah, they're like unique IDs. They're not like, you know, human readable per se. That's how it, each lab is kind of kept unique. So that way you can't do like lab one and then I delete a lab and then I'm like, okay, lab one again. <laughs> um, these are kind of, but that's okay. Um, I wonder if there's a way to get some details though. Um, okay, return details about the specified lab. So you need the lab ID. Okay, that's easy enough. So we'll just do this. Um, we'll just duplicate this one. Duplicate the lab and then we'll call it, um, we'll save as get, get it, um, specific, uh, specific lab. Okay, and we'll just call it, I'll just put the lab ID. I was gonna try to like make it, you know, put a variable that you can then assign. Uh, let's not get that crazy with it. That's pretty cool. That's pretty neat, right? I literally just changed that description. Um, and you'll see the lab title, lab at Monday, 20.08 p.m. Oh my gosh, I'm an idiot. Literally could change it from here. Uh, first lab. I'll just call it first lab. All right, so um, you see when it was created, the lab title was literally just off of this name um, that I just changed. I didn't know you could change that, but I clicked on it and it just, lit up so uh my fault and then lab description um uh, i'm keeping it as is so but let's see if it gets the updated title there you go first lab tells you the number of nodes number of links and then the id yeah so i figured that's what that is so basically you get the labs has the id a, a list i guess you want to point that out this is a list um, and then we get the individual lab. If we, if we use the, that ID, we'll get more details about the lab. So that way, if you created a script, you could say like, okay, um, get the list of all the lab IDs. Um, and the lab IDs don't change. So like, you could technically, you could statically put it in there, like if you knew the lab ID, but let's say you had no idea, you could loop through, it would it would suck, but you could loop through, get the each lab ID, loop through the, each lab ID, you know, using subsequent get requests, and then find the specific lab you're looking for based on any of these properties, like owner, lab title, lab description, the number of nodes. Like let's say you only wanted to get labs that had at least 10 nodes in it. Um, you could easily do some logic. So, dude, this is awesome. Like I said, this is like my raw reaction to it because I don't, I haven't messed with, especially with the API. I've not touched the API 
Um, but this is kind of the way it would like. This is how I how I do it. Um, this is how a lot of people do it. It's just you don't. A lot of times people don't see this um, because it's not really like it's exciting for the person doing it. Like for me, it's this is awesome. Um, you may, you know, what what the end user may see is someone put out there like, oh, like, check out this API. I created this Python script, right? Because I'm already like, like the wheels are churning with like, okay, we can use the request library. You could do all these API calls. You can um, do a post to get that bearer token and then take that token and then do subsequent, you know, calls to either get the, the list of existing labs, create new labs, um, get the overall simulation status. What is this about? Code zero description. I mean, let's just try it out real quick, right? We already have the lab ID. Let's just do state. Started. Oh, okay. So, I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of nice. Um, so all that does is just tell you whether it's, it literally, you just tack on uh, to the resource. I doubt you can do the other ones, but state just pulls up. It extracts just the state value. That's cool. I'm just curious of what other, let's see what other information we can pull. Uh, let's see. I'm, ha I'm going to run this. Because all you need is the lab ID, PyATS underscore testbed. And for those that are like maybe new to the stream or you know watching this and like, why is this dude so obsessed with this PyATS tool? Um, I have a four series blog, uh, four series of blog posts, and um, I've been using PyATS for months now, and I still don't feel like I have it all wrapped. Oh my gosh. You're kidding me. Oh wow. That is gold. That is gold. So anyways, before I dive into this, um yeah, so PyTS it's you know, it's a Python um library. PyTS and Genie and it is a very heavy library and i've talked about it at nauseum probably on the stream and um, in my blog post but i really think it's one of the most complete libraries that has everything from allowing you to collect operational state configuration um, allow you to configure like actually configure devices um, and then rub run subsequent tests on the, those devices um and there's just other little like i mean i swear i find some sort of feature whether it's pyts or genie like something in there i'm like really like what like how how or why did, was this brought up but like it's just one of those things where it's like man like when you think you have it all figured out you find something else so um I'm a firm advocate of the PyTS library. And I also like that it's expanding a little beyond Cisco. Um, like they're building uh, parsers out for Junos. Um, what were some of the other ones? Big IP. Um, I'm trying to think. If there were, there's other ones as well. It's obviously not as big as the Cisco libraries um, or parser libraries, but hey, it's a starting point, right? So, wow. But this, creating a YAML. So for those that don't know, like this is a, um, a YAML document. And basically it's like the core of PyTS is you have to create a, um, a YAML testbed file, which that's what this is, is a testbed file. And that allows PyTS, like it uses this as like the golden document to do everything, to connect to your devices, um, <clears throat> to build like a virtual topology. And you'll even see, you know, some of the kind of the language here, like this topology here, 
it tells you like the iOS V um, device has all these different interfaces. Um, and then you actually can create links. And these links are obviously like this one's link 10. I'm sure if you look through here, you'll see link 10 because if you go to our topology iOS, the iOS V image is hooked to the NX OS uh, image. So if I, you know, if I <laughs> had a good guess, link 10 is probably going to be found on Ethernet 2.1 on the NX OS device. Um, so if I get on NX OS, um, yeah, you'll see link 10, Ethernet 2.1. So it kind of just like, think of it as like a descriptor file, right? It, like it literally, it describes the topology and what PyATS can do with this document is form that topology in PyATS's world and you could do whatever you want. You could add more interfaces, you can delete links, you can kind of basically what this visually looks like, PyATS does through a YAML document, right? And so, and then you have the power of the PyTS and Genie libraries to kind of go through and make any necessary changes, run tests, you know, whatever. So that is, um, that's cool. Man. That is an, that is an awesome endpoint. Um, definitely, definitely we'll check into that more and that may be its own like separate YouTube video. Wow. That's cool. Um, Okay, so let's see, before we wrap up, um, we will definitely be looking at Py, at, Py TS, at CML on Thursday. We'll, we'll kind of continue this in the next stream. Um, we'll probably take a look at, we'll definitely take a look at this API um, a little more, kind of what other things we can do. Because remember, we're only under like the labs endpoint. Um, but I mean, you can do things to specific nodes, interfaces, the links, the system itself, right? Uh, collecting licensing data from the from CML, um, creating web de uh, web image definitions, uh, creating a new definition, and yeah, I figured you you know create like a JSON schema or create a JSON object in the JSON you know in a JSON schema to describe that new image definition and then you just do a post request with it. Yeah, we are definitely gonna be looking at this a lot. Link conditioning, modify link condition. What, what's this about? Dude, no shot. That's, in, that's insane. So you literally just have to specify the lab um, and the specific link ID, and I'm sure I can get the link IDs, you know, from another API call, like get links from this lab. Um, but you can actually, I'm curious of what these numbers represent, like if it's a percentage or let's see if it has a schema. Okay, here we go. Here we go. Uh, maximum. So this is an integer maximum zero to 100. Um, it's either zero, to, I mean, it's 10 base. So zero to 100, zero to 10,000 jitter of the link in milliseconds. Oh my gosh. Okay. So that's, so you can just, if you did jitter 100, it would be a 100 millisecond latency added to that link. So let's say you had QOS or you had, oh my gosh, man, that's awesome. I, I don't want to say like, I know I'm kind of reacting in a way like it's groundbreaking and like there's nothing else out there that can do this. Um, I guess I'm kind of looking at it from a programmatic standpoint. Like that is so easy. Like that is one API call with, with one single payload. And you can basically find a specific link and edit the quality or condition of it from one API call. That's awesome. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's obviously there's a lot, uh, you know, I, I want to dive into, um, yeah, I, I just, I, I think this might be a good place to stop. Um, unless there's any questions, you know, anyone in the chat, 
if you guys have any questions about CML or if there's a particular API call that you'd be interested to take a look at real quick, um, you know, feel free to put it in the chat. Uh, like I said, I'm probably about 30 seconds behind, so I'll kind of let those questions come in if there are any. Um, but wow, I am, I'm excited about this. Like this is, I, I knew CML, like especially CML2, I guess you can call this CML2, um, cause CML1, AKA like viral, it wasn't that great. Um, it was very cumbersome, but this CML2 is pretty polished and, and the API and the features that are exposed um, via the API, it's awesome. And I just, I can imagine, I, th I guess the interesting thing about all this and what I see with this tool is you can actually take CML and if, you know using its API, you can spin up new test labs, define a test lab, spin it up, um, run tests against it with specific configuration items. Uh, I mean, the CSR 1000 Vs run iOS XE, um, you know, the newer, the newer recommended iOS XE, the 17.x train. Um, so it's not like you're running like an older iOS V image, right? That might be on iOS 15, uh, which everyone knows is kind of old school. It's, it's on older devices, whereas iOS XE is kind of the newer thing. Um, hate to say it, a little more bug ridden, uh, most, mostly because of the features that are included with iOS XE and just the extensibility of the platform. Um, but man, you could set up a lab, start it up, apply configuration, test whatever features you want. Um, well, take a step back. Based on that lab, you can generate a PyATS test bed Take that testbed file, spin up, or uh, run that testbed file against a test script, a PyTS test script, which obviously you can include all your test cases, uh, you know, parse any operational data, you know, number of BGP neighbors, or what's the CPU utilization at, which in this case, obviously we have to understand it's virtualized. So like some of the more like your power supplies, more of the environmental um, values, like your power, memory, CPU, like that, you kind of have to take with a grain of salt because it is a virtualized environment, but more control plane operations, like your BGP, or your, your routing protocols, um, any sort of forwarding decisions, you can mimic all that. Get PyATS working, run your tests, have pass fail, do what you want with the test results, and then stop the lab environment, tear it down. Before tearing it down, like deleting it, save, download a YAML file that represents what this uh, looks like. And so that way as like a um, artifact and then pass that along to, or, you know, save it in your CI CD pipeline, pass it along to another engineer to run their tests. Um, and then, you know, you can delete it from CML, but you have, at least have that artifact of like, this is what the lab looked like when I ran my tests. So, man, this is uh, cool stuff. I am thoroughly enjoying using CML and I definitely see a lot of possibilities with it. So I'm glad, you know, we started jumping into it tonight and uh, we'll definitely continue it on Thursday. So uh, I didn't see any questions come into chat, uh, but yeah, if you, if you have any, and you know whether you wanted to share them or if you're watching this on like a playback, um, feel free to hit me up on Twitter at, at DevNetDan. Um, this is really really cool stuff. So um, yeah, that's that's all I really have for tonight. And um, I guess I will be catching you in the next stream, which uh, unless anything crazy happens, will be this Thursday. The let me pop, pull it up real quick the 9th. So December 9th, 8 p.m. We'll be back here. And um, if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to hit me up on Twitter. Um, all right. I will catch you guys in the next one. Peace.
Trust, yeah. No, I don't wanna waste what's left.